So it is a perfect time to react to this video. I am, I don't know what's up or what's down, what's left or what's right anymore. School has dominated my life the last week. You might have noticed a lack of uploads. I've been doing midterm exams, reading, quizzes, papers, and my mind is not as sharp as it should be. It's very late in the evening after doing loads of schoolwork. The wife is sleeping in the other room, and I've got to get some content filmed. So I need to learn the mindset of elite athletes. So today... A mental coach explains how pro athletes think. This is by Sam Martin, peak performance. I'm hoping, it says mindset matters here. I'm hoping I can learn to think like a pro athlete and overcome this season of life right now. <laughs> let's learn how Let's learn how athletes think, uh, how pro athletes get the right kind of mindset, and what can we do to apply that to our lives. All right, let's get into this. What really goes on in the minds of elite athletes? How do they always seem one step ahead of everyone else and unshakable in the face of pressure? Well, over the past year, I've worked with pro athletes across six different sports as their mental performance coach. And today, I'm gonna to tell you the seven things I've observed from working with those in the top 1% of their performance domain. And the best part is, these are all things that you can build and learn yourself. To help you do so, download Hopefully. the free cheat sheet with the link in the description. <laughs> so, are you ready to learn how elite athletes are wired? Well, let's get started. Yes, the first thing that's yes, really yes. telling about elite athletes is that they speak in definitives. So along with coaching guys and girls at the top of their sport, I I've seen Ronaldo do this. He speaks in a very definitive I am kind of statement. Yeah. So work with semi-pro athletes, college athletes, and kids in sports academies. And what I've seen time and time again is that elite athletes are so much more deliberate and intentional with how they speak about their goals and objectives. In our sessions, they'll always say things like, I will do this, or here's how I'm gonna make this happen. Whereas those at lower levels veer more towards uncertain language. They will say things like, I will try mm -hmm. this, or I think I could make this happen. But what difference does this- Oi, oi, that's me. That can be me at times. I'm gonna try to do that. Oh man, I'll try. I don't know, I think that has to do with the fact that I'm learning a new sport right now. But I should translate that even at my beginner level. When I played, uh, when I played hand egg, I think I was more of a speaking in definitives kind of player. But that's just because I was confident in the sport. As I'm playing real football, um, I struggle with the confidence, and I definitely don't speak in definitives. I speak in the kind of language of "I will try to achieve this goal." But I gotta switch that. I gotta switch that up. I know how to be an athlete, so that's actually really helpful for me to to help me kind of turn that page. Actually, make well for the elite athletes. This isn't just confidence or bravado. There's real science behind this approach. Mm. When we speak in definitives, we activate a part of our brain known as the reticular activating system, or RAS. This system acts as a filter for our brain, prioritizing information that aligns with our conscious thoughts and goals. When we use definitive language like I will, I can, or I am, the RAS works to bring our attention to the opportunities and resources that can help us achieve those goals. In contrast, uncertain language such as I will try or I think I could introduces doubt and ambiguity. Hmm. This can cause the RAS to become confused and less effective in guiding our actions towards our goals. Uh, so Because really it's calculating a possibility in which the the goal is not achieved i can see that boil this down using more definitive language causes your brain to become more geared towards searching for or coming up with solutions so I that's why elite athletes progress so much more rapidly than amateurs they are commanding their brain to think about new training solutions or to learn more about new tactics or techniques it just leads to a lot more action and it really is action takers who rise to the top mm. and this ties into the next thing that really reveals how pro athletes are wired they understand the cost of inaction. Being a top athlete is pricey, especially in individual sports where how much you make relies upon prize money, being lucky with national body funding and a few sponsorships here and there. So many elite athletes have to self-fund the things that will improve their game. Things like physio and massage, strength and conditioning coaching, a nutritionist, and also working with someone like me on their psychology. But what I've noticed is that a lot of pros don't see these things as costs. They mm. understand that Important. they are actually investments. Because the money they put into these things provides greater returns, sometimes even 10 or even 100 times their initial investment. They know the true cost is inaction. Not investing in these things will lessen their chances of 
winning tournaments and therefore prize money, getting an improved contract or meeting performance-based bonuses. One crucial mindset shift that sets pro athletes apart is their ability to detach from a scarcity mindset. Instead of wasting money on unnecessary things like a $200 pair of sneakers or bottle service at the club, they prioritize investing in performance boosting services. They Most of them. <laughs> I know, maybe, maybe I'm just tainted by American sports, but a lot of a lot of American athletes that I see definitely waste their money on booze and partying and a lot of stuff. But he's right. The elite, the elite athletes, the best of the best, do tend to invest heavily in their body, in their trainers, in their uh, programs that they do. So I think he's right about that. By the way, guys, uh, I am reacting to the highlights from all the, the champions league games that i missed while i've been working on paper paper papers and essays and exams so if you want to check out the patreon the link will be in the description down below i just reacted to the real madrid dortmund debacle uh what a wild game i literally just finished that one up and i'm going to be checking out a lot of the other ones that i missed so if you're interested in that check out the patreon it's in the link this link in the description below all right. They know that $200 spent on some form of coaching could be the key to unlocking peak performance for them, which is a cheap price for something that many people would consider priceless. The very elite know that by investing in themselves and their craft, they are creating opportunities for success and longevity in their careers. Think of LeBron James. He spends a whopping $1.5 million a year on his mind and body. But that investment allows him to earn $47 million a year in salary. The elite like him know that it's not about the money spent, but the value gained. Next mm -hmm. up is maybe an obvious one, and I know we just spoke a lot about money, which is of course a motivator in sport, but the very elite are actually much more intrinsically motivated. This means the money, the fame, and the praise is secondary to them. It's typically mm. in my first session with pro athletes that we explore their motivations, and they almost always say things like, I want to be proud of my performances. Or, yeah. I want to know that I left everything out. Achieve something. We'll then gloss over other things like winning a championship or making a move to a better team with a better contract. But everything stems from their deep, deep desire to perform at the best of their abilities on a consistent basis. Many pros I've worked with have concerns that they're gonna live with regret if they yeah. don't find a way to- Nothing worse than looking back and realizing that you could have done more. I, that's what I did recently when I realized that if I had poured more effort and time into my career, <laughs> career, my playing in hand egg when I was in high school, that I could have actually achieved something in that sport, I was quite good at it. Uh, but I didn't put in the necessary effort, and actually, after then, after that, I let let my body get away from me, and so now I'm sitting here with a lot of health problems when I really could have been playing at the top of my game, which is why I'm motivated so heavily to keep playing uh, football or soccer. I'm so motivated to learn and train it and and get good at it, not because I think I'm going to have a career as a player but because I, I want to achieve something athletically by putting in the effort uh, and, and playing at the best of my absolute ability with my maximum effort at some point again in my life. And it's just kind of making up for the regret of, boy, if I had put in harder work when I was in better shape, when I was training more regularly, if I had put in the extra effort, not cut corners in the training because I was tired, if I had really, really dialed in the effort back then, I could have played at the top of my top of my game. And it's not even about achieving something great in the in the sport or in my career. It's more about man looking back. I didn't give it my all like I could have, and so yeah, I think that's super super important to look back and be retrospectively look back at a career and be like I don't want any regrets so I'm going to invest in and what I got to invest in to, to, to be better who consistently squeeze out their best and when I ask them what does their best actually look like they rarely talk about coming in first place or winning the cup final instead they talk about being a true impact player executing the skills they've practiced thousands of hours before inch perfectly on game day and silencing the inner critic that says 
you could have done more. So how can athletes cultivate and nurture this intrinsic motivation? Well, it's unique to the individual as it's about internal drive. Mm. But typical things that help and I've seen the most success with in my athletes is to set meaningful goals, focus on goals that are aligned with personal growth and improvement rather than external rewards. This could be mastering a new skill, improving fitness levels, or just enhancing your mental resilience. Another thing is to stay connected with your why. Regularly remind yourself of why you started playing your sport and what really is the higher purpose of putting yourself through so much pain, struggle, and hard work. The most purpose-driven athletes are not only the ones that reach the top, mm. but it's also what helps them stay there. It's what helps them maintain focus and commitment during the challenging times. And that in itself is the next thing I've typically seen characteristic of pro athletes. I wonder if he's gonna talk about specific athletes. The higher you climb up in sport, the more unfun things there are. Elite level sport is serious business. It's not at that point a game anymore. And the life of a pro athlete often involves a lot of boring elements that some actually hate to do, but they stick to them because of their benefits. Things like long film sessions, where athletes have to spend hours each week watching their own tapes and oh, yeah. position. It's much more I love film though. They're training all the time rather than being stuck in a stuffy room with an analyst going over film. Other things include the no, I love travel film. of long coach rides, flight after flight, and hundreds of nights throughout your career spent bored out of your mind in hotels. And many athletes absolutely hate to do gym work, and it forever feels like a chore to do those two or three sessions a week. But the pros I've worked with, they commit to these things. They don't pretend that every waking second of being a pro athlete is a dream. It's just like any other job where there will be some things that are mind-numbingly dull. But the elite develop a super high tolerance for boredom to levels that a lot of amateurs or semi-pros just end up saying, nah, it's not worth it. They build this tolerance by building countless routines, rituals, and also get creative with gamifying their gym workouts or developing hobbies outside their sport to keep their mind Damn. off during all the Damn travel time and there. nights away from their home in hotel rooms on their own. But true commitment is all about doing the things that you need to do, even when you least feel like doing it. This is an absolute must to make it at the pro level and also to stay there. And this directly relates to the next thing, the very elite rarely complain. I've worked with athletes who have gone through some really tough and sometimes hmm. really unfair situations. Things like serious injuries, getting dropped from the starting team without any explanation, and plenty of the coaches that just seem to have a personal vendetta against them. Hmm. But compared to amateur athletes who easily fall into the trap of moaning and whining about these things, the pros just get on with it. The clue, right. after all, is in the name. They are professional athletes. Professional so they athletes, act yeah. professionally in all situations, even those that they have a right to be frustrated or upset about. They conduct themselves with grace, and despite not being happy with certain situations, they almost always adopt a pragmatic approach. They adopt what's called an internal locus of control, essentially where they I've focus almost exclusively on everything that is directly within their control. Don't look to blame others. Yeah. Don't look at what other people have done. Don't look at any other circumstance other than what I can control. Uh, yeah, I like this. Way. I I like this philosophy in life. It's like, yeah, there might be times where there's somebody did you wrong and you have a disadvantage that you have to overcome. But look, everyone's at some point gonna have disadvantages, and it everyone's gonna have situations that are not fair, or there are gonna be things beyond our control. So focus on what you can control. Focus on how you can, how you can uh, achieve what you want. Yeah. Or bad luck for their situation. They take ownership and just focus on sticking to the process, keeping faith that their situation will improve. So they may occasionally vent to me about these frustrations, but they do so in a constructive way, always looking for solutions rather than just using me as an outlet to just complain and feel sorry about themselves for an hour. So if you're a serial complainer, you just need to cut that out. It won't take your games to the next level and it can actually damage your situation further because sport at the end of the day is highly social. And if you're giving off toxic vibes, you will worsen the relationship that you have with coaches and teammates. You have to let go of that which concerns you, but you have no direct control or influence over it because if you don't, you'll waste countless time and energy that could be spent on actually making the desired changes that you're looking mm. for. Doing this is all about reframing the stresses, obstacles, and hurdles that you're thrown as an athlete. And what the top pros also do is leverage stress to their advantage. They are masters at moving away from threat appraisals and instead flipping them into challenge appraisals. In other words, they see negatives as challenges to overcome rather than threats that could ruin their performance or career. Mm. I've worked with pros who, despite playing at the highest level for many years, still have butterflies in their stomach before every performance. And they also get a touch of performance anxiety for big workouts or training sessions. But really? they've learned that these are just signals from your body that you're about to face something important. Butterflies in your stomach is nothing more than 
blood being redirected away from that area to other parts that's needed most, such as your brain and your arms and legs. And the top pros don't try to completely eliminate this. They look to channel it in the right way and dial into it. They become masters at engaging in routines that either slightly bring up their arousal level or slightly bring it down so that they're in the sweet spot for peak performance. Whether that's breathing exercises or physical- I'm not gonna lie, this is a fascinating video uh, by this, I guess he's a sports psychologist. When I saw Messi on the thumbnail, I thought I was going to get some specifics of the mindset of specific athletes and how they approach things. It's okay. It's okay. It's been a it's been an interesting video, a little bit clickbaity because I was wanting to hear about Messi and his his mindset and some of the other top athletes, but it's been very informative. So, maybe maybe we should reframe what clickbait is. If if it gets you to click and it gives you good information and you enjoy it, is it really clickbait? even if it's not exactly what you wanted. Yeah, it's still clickbait. Physical routines or even visualization, they use these mental tools to help themselves convince their mind and body that it's now go time, that they have nothing to worry about and that these feelings that they're having are the fuel that they need to do their thing. There's a quote from the ex NFL quarterback, Jim Kelly, where he says, I threw up before. Poor Jim Kelly. Jim Kelly went to four straight Super Bowls to the Buffalo Bills and lost all four of them. A couple of them at the hands of my Dallas Cowboys. Although uh, they're not performing well, and I haven't seen them perform well in my lifetime. This was before I was born. Anyway. Every single football game I played, and I did so through my NFL career. It was good pressure. It was pressure to be good. That's the kind of stress appraisal the very elite make. They know that perception is everything and will determine whether they come in clutch under pressure or choke under pressure. But deep down, they know this is a continual process. As said, the butterflies may never go away, but you can always get better at dealing with them. And this relates to the final thing that really separates pro athletes, their strivers, not reachers. The top 1% athlete never feels like he or she has finally made it. Even when they get to the top, they rarely feel that they've reached mm. their potential. They keep striving day in, day out. But this is not necessarily a bad thing because they are self-aware enough to know that what they really love is the process and the journey. The destination right. is of course welcomed and enjoyed, such as signing the first pro deal, representing your country for the first time, or winning your first championship. But the very elite always have an eye on the next thing. They get more of a rush from chasing. If they reach number one in the world, they ask, what will I do to become the longest running number one? Hmm. Or if they go on a club record scoring run, they ask, right. what's the league scoring run? It's this striving that keeps them in it for the long run. But that striving can only come in being at peace with the fact they'll never be perfect, nor should they continue to chase that indefinitely. Instead, it's just about continually getting better and continually moving the goalposts of better forward each season. How do they do this? Well, watch this video next on how getting rid of perfectionism. Aha. He's got me into his his uh, content spiral. I see you there. I see you making good use of your, uh, your in-screen click-throughs. Hey, you guys go, uh, go show this guy some love. Sam Martin, Peak Performance, great channel. I'll go ahead and subscribe. Uh, that was a helpful video. And um, I am, if you enjoyed my video, go ahead and smash like on it. Hopefully, I'll be mo more coherent in future reactions when I haven't been spending my entire lifetime taking essays and exams and quizzes. If you've made it this far in the comment section, could you please just type, school sucks. School freaking.